Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones. I'm going to do a video here on roof decks, primarily residential construction, but this will apply to light commercial. Uh, roof decks for residential construction wood frame that would be getting asphalt shingles mostly, or although it could, could apply to metal roof. And the reason being is that I've done videos, I did a four part series last March on the non-vented roof and the use of closed cell foam. Four parts covers off all the information. Go check that out. That'll bring you up to speed on the science of non-vented and use of closed cell foam. And then prior to that, I had done a shingle life video on whether or not shingles uh, degrade quicker with the use of a non-vented roofing system. So there's five videos there that you can check out. This is going to sort of be a sixth come apartment to that which would be roof decks water and the use of, of uh, spray foam so if your roof decks getting wet if you're dealing with rain dealing with underlays dealing with damage dealing with water leaks and closed cell or open cell foam what all is involved in that and that's what we're going to get into today a lot of this is just going to be tech info if you're building a house or you're building a structure and you have some serious questions about going spray foam, I think this is really going to be the video uh, that you're looking for. Now, the other five videos are really, really relevant too. Don't miss out on them. Check them out in the library. But this one here, I'm going to try and sum up. I can't do it all of it. It'll be an, over an hour long and nobody will watch it to the end. But let's go over in the next 20 minutes or less here sort of the high points and the most common questions. So we can define our terms. Uh, normal construction is going to be a wood truss, whether it's solid or engineered. Uh, it's going to have a pitch of 312 or steeper. Most of the, the pitch of roof is going to be uh, 512, 612. And then in the light commercial sector or even somewhere the advanced residential, it might be a 112 pitch. Uh, very very slow low slope we might call that uh, quasi flat roof although it's never perfectly flat most of the roofing materials are going to be either plywood or OSB and then they're going to have either shingles uh, with some underlay partial or complete and then quite possibly a membrane system for the commercial light commercial or the or the low slope and then of course all hosts of metal roofing most of all of the the rules apply to metal roofing I just want to get metal roofing out of the way um, most of the time you're gonna be putting some sort of an underlayment down and then they're gonna put the metal roofing down whether it's standing seam or, or different different kinds that really doesn't bother me at all there's really no detrimental effects from heat from weather for hail uh, metal roofing when it's properly seamed and in place is impervious and you're, you're looking at a uh, 100 200 300 year product uh, when you've had it installed correctly so the majority of this video from here on forward is going to be the questions of people that are dealing with uh, shingles and underlay and what happens if and when water gets behind it and uh, what kind of foam should we be using open cell or closed cell so that we understand the number one defense for roof degradation and roof damage is the actual roofing material to the exterior the spray foam is not going to add or remove and we'll get into why it doesn't remove structural integrity over the long term but your principal waterproofing never has been and never will be open or closed cell foam to the underside of the roof deck so you to make your structure watertight and weather tight need to be putting down the proper roofing materials and I'm not a roofer I'm not going to try to be I don't know a lot of their terminology that well but I can draw on my 17 years of installing foam with Jones and we have seen almost every kind of roof and we've been putting closed cell foam to the underside of nearly every kind of roof and that's what we're going to talk about here today is our experience on our what we've encountered and, and the specifications that we do so you've got to go and have 
shingles on a roof deck. Now, the majority of people are putting underlays on nowadays. Uh, we didn't used to always see underlay under 100% of the roof. We used to see an ice and water shield in the valleys, in the corners, in the edges, at the transitions. More and more commonly now, we're seeing some type of uh, vapor diffusion open membrane of some type. Uh, it's not a self-adhering membrane, but they're going to put some sort of a, uh, a lapped product on the roof prior to putting the shingles down. And what that is, is that's defense number two. So your primary defense is gonna be the shingle. Um, we don't see a whole lot of asphalt shingles anymore. It's mostly gonna be uh, a fiberglass shingle product. Um, and then from there, the, that's the primary defense. And then the secondary is the underlay. That way, if any water gets past the first, you've got something as a drainage plane uh, to deal with it after. The underlay is a great idea it's a good idea it's used in a lot of situations i have no objections to it whatsoever when dealing with steel products it's almost always mandatory i say because with a metal product you're going to be dealing with some type of moisture that gets past a seam or a screw or a joint at some point or a piece of flashing and therefore uh, you want to get that water down off the roof and not come in contact with the wood products as much as possible with shingles, uh, you're starting to see more and more people that are putting the underlays down, although purists and some of the old school ways is just plywood roof deck, OSB roof deck, down go the shingles, that's your waterproofing and, and your flashing. Your exterior has to be watertight. You're never ever choosing the foam, ever, to be your waterproofing layer. So now, once you have established a watertight seal to the outside of the roof deck, what product a foam insulation should you be putting to the underside of the roof. I believe this is not really a case for open cell foam. So the two discussions will be, well, let's go open cell foam to where if we have a leak, uh, the water will come through the foam and drip to the inside because it's open cell. And then we'll know we'll have a leak. We don't know where the leak is going to be, but there'll be a leak and we can start investigating and doing a leak for a leak. That is a really, really flawed logic, and it's a really, really bad idea. I've uh, never been a proponent of open cell foam on roof decks, primarily because we're in a very cold climate, and we need the vapor barrier qualities that the closed cell foam offers, and we don't want to take extra time consuming steps with open cell foam uh, to try and establish that vapor barrier. But let's just go on the logic here of the vapor barrier is not an issue like it is for parts of the United States, uh, southern United States. What happens if you have a leak? So you're saying if there is a leak, if it gets past the underlay, if it gets past the shingle or the metal roofing product, then I want it to go through my open cell insulation. Well, that's a bad, bad idea because open cell insulation can hold an enormous amount of water for a very, very long time before it reaches saturation point and has to start letting some of it go. So you could be dealing with a big sponge up against your roof deck that's holding an enormous amount of water, depending on where the leak is, how severe the leak is, and how long the leak has been going for. I don't believe in allowing that leak to come in and permeate through and soak into the insulation and then start dripping. By the time it starts dripping into the house, you could have a huge mess on your hands. How are you gonna dry all of that water out of the open cell foam? It can be a real issue. Uh, likewise, it can get heavy enough that it can start to tear it and the mass, the weight on the mass of the foam can cause the foam to peel off the roof deck and come down. Now, I guess you're on an insurance claim at that point and you would deal with it the same way you deal with a roof leak that's been dripping into fibrous and blowing in insulation uh, like conventional methods which by the way water dripping into the attic and then wrecking and staining drywall so that you know you have a leak is really a poor way of establishing whether or not you've got a roofing problem um, I know it's old-fashioned thinking but we have to jog ourselves out of this when you go with a closed cell foam to the underside of the roof deck uh, the foam insulation is going to stop 99% uh, water leakage. So if you have a breach on the outside, uh, the water is going to have to work a lot harder to find a way in. And I'll just demonstrate uh, with this um,
cross-sectional detail. This is a detail provided by uh, Huntsman Polyurethanes and, and Building Solutions showing uh, the underside of a roof deck being sprayed. So this would be uh, your metal, this would be your shingles, this would be your underlay, all of your roofing materials here. You've got your plywood deck here, and then you've got whatever, two, three, four, five inches of closed cell foam. Don't, don't worry about what they've drawn here. Uh, your state, your county, your province, you can draw uh, what you need for code approval or for engineering approval. But the underside of the roof deck is sprayed. So you can still have a breach somewhere here. The water would come in to the foam or try to come to the foam and then it would be terminated. Now, well, the reason that I say it's 99% going to stop the water is that you see where you've got a double here? You've got two trusses put together. If you have a girder truss where there's two or three or four trusses stacked together to pick up the weight, you can have a breach, and I'll just roll to the top here a bit. You can have a breach at the top and have the water coming between the seams where the spray foam isn't. And the only thing that's gonna stop it is caulking or if you've skinned this over with foam, the water can find another way out on the girder truss and into the attic. And I have seen that happen, where it's running down the girder truss a long ways, maybe 10, 12 feet to where there is no more spray foam, where there doesn't need to be spray foam applied, and it's finding a way to drip out, and it's going between the girder trusses, all due to the fact that um, a shingle has been ripped off in a windstorm or something like that, and there's a total bare spot on the roof deck, and the water's getting in and, and finding a seam to run in and down. Now, the closed cell foam is stopping it, from absorbing into the insulation itself. Uh, it's not allowing it to come into the attic and wreck other things in the attic or get other things wet. So again, 99 or 99.8% is dry and just the amount of water penetration coming in uh, can be to here. Now, what if you did not know that that was going on? What if the water did not drip into the attic? Uh, what would happen then? The answer is nothing. Um, if we look at a low slope system here that is you know, worst case scenario for drainage time, uh, if there was a breach, the water would soak in and damage the area of where there is a bare spot. So let's say you've got a um, quarter inch diameter hole. Well, what's going to become damaged? A very small ring of area around that quarter inch hole because it cannot soak into the closed cell foam and affect the other wood structure. So the amount that it can wick is just the small amount that the wood itself, which is the natural wicking effect that the wood would have, regardless of whether the drip comes all the way through to the inside or not. But instead, it is terminated stopped at the surface level where the closed cell foam is and the damage is re restricted to only the epicenter of where the bare spot, the hole, the damage, the flashing is. Uh, if it's on the slope and it's obtaining higher up on the roof and then running behind the shingles, yes, it has more opportunity to run and wet the back side of the shingles to cause premature failure, to cause more premature damage to other pieces of plywood further down. Um, the advantage being that it's not being permitted into the attic space and that uh, you wouldn't cause as much interior damage to the structure. Now, I suppose you could say that a, a leak that is running on an angle on the slope and it's getting behind the shingles for quite some time uh, could be harder to, to detect. However, let's take residential construction for a second and I'm going to go back up to the sloped roof picture. All right, so you've got a breach on a flashing 20 feet up at, near the peak. The water is running uh, behind the shingles and it's getting the back side of the shingles wet. Uh, it's made it past the flashing, past whatever, it doesn't matter. It's running down, it's getting this roof deck wet. When you get to your soffiting areas, the soffits are going to be 
perforated or there's going to be seams in the soffits. Either way, the soffiting area is not airtight and watertight. So the water, once it gets into this area, is going to find an area to drip out. And rather than making it towards the gutters and into the east troughs and down, you're going to see excessive amount of water coming out, bottom out. Let me scroll downward here. You can see the softening area. You're going to see water coming out of the softening area, dripping, getting the outside of the exterior wet. And usually when water has been running down a roof deck behind the shingles it's dirty water it's dusty water it's carrying a colorant of some sort the back of the shingles the tar the adhesives um, just the natural glues and what have you that are used in making the products that water is going to be brown it's going to be dirty colored and that water is going to leave a staining effect on the outside of the softening and on the outside of the building now i have seen this personally I've seen where a breach happened. It wasn't mysterious. It was a shingle that got missed, right? It, it got ripped off. It's missing. The water got behind the other shingles that are below the missing shingle. The spray foam backed up the roof deck, didn't allow the water to come into the structure. The water ran down behind multiple shingles for however long, 15, 18 feet of run. And that's exactly what it did. It came out at the soffiting area and it left a brown stain on the siding and it left a brown mark on the soffit. Now, the homeowner already knew that the shingle's missing and they need to get it fixed. But the outward evidence that something else is going on, even if that shingle wasn't missing, even if it was something else that was a piece of flashing that wasn't obvious to see, the indicators of water running irregularly behind the shingles and making a staining effect on the outside of the structure uh, was the way that it was detected. Now, let's say that it's not detected. Let's go one step further. Let's say that you didn't see anything, and that due to the nature of how it uh, became wet and where it became wet, you just did not see it. Okay, then yes, you're going to turn uh, the plywood, uh, depending on how long this has been going for, it's going to damage it. It's going to mush it. It's going to degradate it, all right? How is that going to be fixed? How does the roofer deal with this uh, after this has been going on for 10, 10 or 15 or 20 years? The answer is uh, they would peel, peel up the shingles. That's when they would notice that the damage has been happening. It would be limited to the plywood itself. The plywood itself is gonna take uh, 90% or better. The rafters are encased in foam. The structural integrity of all of that top wood is still intact. Uh, and at that point, a saw and roofing material methods for cutting the uh, damaged plywood would be done. The pieces would be pried out with little to no uh, difficulty against the foam. Uh, the foam can, the spray foam can be touched up with can foam, DIY foam, or even getting the spray foam guy back. Uh, an adhesive can be applied to the surface of the foam, like a, a polyurethane adhesive. A new piece of plywood is cut uh, and formed and placed back down in and screwed back into the structure, and then the new underlay and the new shingles are replaced. It's really not that big of a deal. If there's enough damage that constitutes replacing it, it's going to be fairly easy to pull it up. Uh, if you notice that the damage is extensive and has been going on for a long time. I mean, one, you can be on a potential uh, insurance claim if you want to have insurance paying for roof repairs. But let's say insurance says, no, we're not paying for condensation. We're not paying for uh, neglect. We're not paying for uh, a bad design where you had one valley draining to another valley and it rotted out between the two valleys. Okay, then uh, it's just going to be a remove. It's going to be a cut out, a surgical cut out, and a and a remove. I mean, how much damage, how much difficulty is it to remove plywood and the shingles as it is already? It's not that difficult. With the spray foam backing it up, if the plywood's already been damaged and rotted, it's not going to be very hard to get it to be removed and replaced. I have seen a situation one time, it wasn't spray foam's fault at all, that a roof was damaged, the shingles were damaged, the plywood deck was damaged. And what they did was they removed the shingles, 
They kept the spray foam to the underside of the roof deck. They removed the shingles. They placed brand new sheeting. Uh, well, they laid cribbing down. Then they placed brand new sheeting over top of that, over the cribbing. New underlay, brand new shingles, brand, basically a brand new roof over top of the existing roof. Again, spray foam wasn't the problem. It was the shingle and the lack thereof and the damage that had sustained to that roof deck. So the uh, a false roof, secondary roof, was placed over top of the existing one. In an extreme case. And I want to say something here to the, to the naysayers. We're not going to generalize from specific failures. So specific people that didn't do their job or didn't use the right products or they got their buddy on the weekend with a case of beer to, to, to do the roof. Like there's always a backstory when a roof fails. It's always... Like I had a guy that lost uh, 60% of the shingles on his roof. It was a spray foam roof that we had done. Uh, it had nothing to do with the spray foam. It had to do with the fact that he hired an off-duty police officer that did roofs on the weekend. The guy used the wrong nails. So... And he didn't flash it right, and he didn't do a lot of things right. And when the first big plow wind came in, gone were the shingles. So uh, he kept the plywood in place and brought in a whole new roofing company, Professionals, on an insurance claim, and they re-shingled the whole entire roof. And they called me, and they were asking me if there was going to be any problems. I said, no, like there's no problems. Just go ahead, stand up there, bang the new shingles in, uh, pound them in, and away you go. So specific failures and the reasons that led to those aren't something that we want to take as a generalization and apply that to all roofs right now had he had uh, open cell foam and had all these leaks he could have had damaged foam he could have been doing a retrofit inside drywall could have been coming down it could have been triple quadruple the cost instead with closed cell foam they're only dealing with damage to the exterior of the building that's my exact point and none of the interior space needs to be touched and dealt with because the closed cell foam has held it 99% of the water to the outside. That makes a really good argument for putting underlay down. If you're really concerned about you know, leak getting past the shingle or the flashing or what have you or all these types of things or whether your cousin's going to be doing the shingles for you, then got, fine. Get get the bloody underlay, put it down. It's cheap insurance. I don't know, what is it? 12, 1400, 2000 bucks, 3000 bucks. Doesn't matter. Then lay the shingles down. Then you've got twice the protection. Anything that gets past the shingle now has to get past the underlay. Chances are you're not going to be damaging and rotting out a plywood roof deck at that point with closed cell foam. So when you, when you think about roof rot, though, old school roof rot is caused by internal condensation within the attic assembly. So you have a very wet, moist uh, attic that has air leakage issues it has condensation build up in ultra cold climates and as a result there's a constant wetting cycle to the underside of the roof deck from within unlimited amount of humidity in the winter time coming up against the roof deck and then soaking saturating uh, and repeatedly getting uh, through a freeze thaw cycle and that's what causes a lot of premature roof uh, decay uh, whereas external water getting a roof deck wet and keeping it repeatedly wet uh, generally not as much uh, that's what we've seen condensation damage from within so to begin wrapping up um, underlays are great on wood frame construction metal shingles or metal roofing materials of any kind underlay is great for uh, fiberglass and asphalt shingles when you're dealing with uh, old school deck boards and old school retrofits uh, you got an old home from the 1920s 1930s term of the century whatever a lot of times th there's no plywood in those and they've got huge spacing so you're going to be dealing with a roofer to retrofit that roof and bring that roof externally to a modern standard uh, that's a whole nother video in and of itself whether you want to uh keep uh, clay tile or terracotta or lead or slate or what have you I, I i can endlessly go on and on and on about what to do but this is mostly new construction or uh, modern construction in the last 30 years we spray in canada in very cold climate closed cell foam to the underside of roof deck have been doing it for 17 years we are not the pioneers of this by any means 
in Ontario and BC in the United States, this has already been going on for 30 years. Nevada, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, California, this has all been reviewed. We took the, the information that was already present through the Spray Foam Polyurethane Foam Alliance, the Canadian Urethane Foam Contractors Alliance, and University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, combined a lot of their uh, non-vented roof details and the recommendations that were there and then just, just took that information and started using that in our areas. We've had zero problems in 17 years. Uh, when the shingles are put on properly and the, and the professional backs their work up with a proper warranty, the spray foam neither adds to it or degradates the structure. In fact, we eliminate a lot of the twisting and the uh, heaving. We add structural support. We add an additional waterproofing layer, although we don't sell it as that. We're 99%. So if you do lose shingles in a plow in, and I've seen that happen where homeowners have lost huge swaths of shingles due to a high windstorm, the spray foam guys aren't in the same amount of panic to get the immediate roof back to water integrity. Uh, so I think there's a lot of advantages that way. I do not believe in the, in the open cell foam to the underside of the roof deck in direct intimate contact with the roof deck where it can soak up and take uh, water into it. I think it's just a matter of time until it has problems. In fact, I have spoken to one individual that did some open cell foam roofs on a budget and he said that they all had issues down the road due to a leak getting in, moisture coming in, condensation somewhere coming in, soaking into the open cell foam and becoming a sponge over time. So I think whether you're in Texas or whether you're in California or you're in Florida or you're in Oregon, you're in Massachusetts, you're in Ontario, Quebec, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, I think the closed cell foam still is the undisputed king of getting the roofing done. If you can't afford the closed cell foam, then maybe just look going conventional. Otherwise, free up more budget to go closed cell foam because it's adding the structural support and you're not having to deal with uh, damage, easy damage that comes into the structure and ruins other parts of it. The closed cell foam is going to hold it and terminate it. And we've seen this in the wintertime. I mean, you're just, you're not seeing condensation problems with the spray foam to the underside of the roof deck. And in the summertime, you don't have air conditioning problems with uh, cool attics touching against something that's extremely hot. And then the water issue, if you do lose shingles, if you do have uh, building degradation on the outside somehow, some way, something's compromised, it's not immediately letting that water in. Now, uh, you've got to have the best possible envelope that you can to the exterior and then put the best possible envelope that you can to the interior. If you want to be using very low permeable membranes, self-adhering membranes, peel and stick membranes, torch on membranes. Okay, fine. But again, we don't generalize from specific instances. So that's a case by case treatment as to what membrane you're putting, what the moisture content is. And generally speaking, that's going to have some sort of a third party reviewing and writing the specifications, sealing those drawings and taking the authority uh, for code compliance and for warrantable situations. That's not what we're here to discuss. I'm here to discuss the fact that it's not crippling to your project to go with closed cell foam to the underside of the roof put shingles down to put an underlay down and to know that you've got a 30 40 50 year product here to the extent of the professionalism of the products that you choose and the people that you have installing them so when those two things made up correct good product and a good installation you've got a multi-generational purchase so i probably missed a few things here again i didn't want this to become uh 45 to an hour long video we could go into great detail about other things uh, leave a comment here ask some questions tell me what else you'd like to see what you want to discuss maybe we'll do a follow-up video to this one and cover off areas and if you're considering this uh, for your build this summer hopefully this video is of use to you and you've stayed to the end right on thank you you're a diehard um, follower and I appreciate it lay out the comment click on the like and the subscribe love to hear from you and we'll catch you on the next one soon